It is a great pleasure for me to introduce you to my colleague, Linda Reed, Professor of History and also Director of the University of Houston's African American Studies Program. Linda Reed's, though, much more than a colleague. She is also a comrade uh, as we study issues of ethnicity and race. Linda is the author of two important books. One is called Simple Decency and Common Sense. It looks at the interracial struggle for racial justice in the South before the rise of the modern civil rights movement. And she's also the editor of We Specialize in the Holy Impossible, which brings together the latest writings in black women's history. Now, before I let Linda speak, I'm going to say just a few words about the issue of ethnicity. For more than 150 years, social scientists and many politicians have been anticipating eagerly the disappearance of ethnicity and race. We are told that international trade and mass communications will make ethnic divisions evaporate. And despite 150 years of predictions, it has not happened. Instead, what we are witnessing around the globe, not just in the United States, but everywhere, is a resurgence of identities based on ethnicity and race. Nothing makes that more concrete than the fact that in the 1990s alone, so far, 20 nations based largely on ethnicity or race have been created. So again, uh, predictions of ethnicity going into the dustbin of history have simply not happened. Now, one thing that interests me is that the very word ethnicity is surprisingly new. It only entered the English language in the 1950s. But if the word is new, the concept is old. Uh, but there is ethnicity and then there is ethnicity. Some ethnic identities can easily be shed, but other ethnic identities, we might say, are imposed upon us. They are much more all-inclusive, self-defining, and all-defining. And in studying African Americans in the United States, it's crucial to be aware of that. By ethnicity, we generally mean a sense of kinship, a sense of group solidarity, and a common culture rooted in a shared historical experience. And for no group of people has that been more true than of African Americans. Now, what makes racial identity so powerful in the United States is that it is closely connected to economic inequalities and life opportunities. Let me just say a couple of words about that before handing the floor to Linda. What is the cost of being black in America? It can actually be quite easily quantified. For a male, it is eight years in life expectancy. The difference between 72 years for the average American and 64 years for the average black male. It's twice the chance of being unemployed, and that's been true for more than three decades, year in, year out. It's half the chance of attending college. It means that 2% of college professors are black, 3% of doctors, 4% of lawyers. Those are not figures from 1950 or 1960. Those are figures from 1997. And so one issue that we need to contemplate as our class comes to a close is whether the United States is truly a ethnic melting pot where people mute their traditions and mute 
their differences and come to share a common commitment to individualism, or whether maybe the United States is quite a different country, a exclusionary society that homogenizes complex identities into rigid ethnic and racial categories. So if we're going to understand the way our society truly is, I think we would do well to listen to what Linda has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Those are some very important statistics. What I want to share with you at this point is um, some information on the field of African American studies. And I want to present to you a model that was shared with a group of scholars in the fall of 1984 at Purdue University in Indiana. This was a conference that was held at Purdue University which focused on African American history, but the field of the presentation really can apply to African American studies in general. And the model was simply to look at the field in terms of the past, the present, and the future. What kinds of things had been accomplished already, what kinds of things were going on currently, and then what kinds of things can we expect in the future. In the field of African American studies, we know that this is interdisciplinary. The field is based on history being very central because uh, we need to always know about our past, what kinds of things occurred as a way to try to sort out things currently and what kinds of things to expect in the future. The field is also based on art, anthropology, sociology, political science, psychology, and music. Um, more recently, we've added cultural studies, which would include things of uh, popular culture, nature, what kinds of food do uh, people enjoy that would define a heritage, things of that nature. So there's a very wide spectrum of disciplines that constitute African American studies. Now, on co college campuses throughout the United States, we know African American studies as a very young field. That is that on major campuses, this is a discipline that began in the late 1960s. One of the first programs was at Yale University in 1968-1969. At the very same time, there were other programs that were formed in, uh, on other campuses in the country. One of those other places was the University of Houston. Initially, these programs were uh, urged to begin by the activism from students. Why was that so? A lot of the students, African American and Anglo Americans, stated that there had not been enough of information shared on people of African descent in the regular college curriculum and they wanted that specifically addressed. And this would be addressed by the formation of African American studies programs on various campuses. So there was a lot of activism from campus to campus. Um, but in terms of the study of things related to people of African descent, that preceded the formation of programs in the 1960s. And so that is the past that I want to tell you about before we talk about the current and then some of the things to expect in the future. The things that preceded the 1960s emphasis on programs on college campuses were individuals who took their time to present to Americans and to the world what had been the past of African Americans prior to the enslavement process for one, uh, what had been some of the things that occurred to African Americans in enslavement and what had been some of the things that they had participated in after the enslavement process. Um, of course, these early scholars emphasized that Africans in Africa had an organized life. That is, that they had uh, political formations, family formations. Um, their lives were organized much in the way that society organizes life in uh, present times. And um, 
one of the earliest of the individuals to be able to do this was George Washington Williams. Um, there is an older biography by John Hope Franklin, who is, I should turn it the other way, um, by John Hope Franklin, who is one of the senior scholars of my time. He is of another generation. John Hope Franklin was born in 1915, and we are very pleased that he has been able to celebrate 82 years uh, with us, but he has been a very busy scholar. And it was through John Hope Franklin's biography on George Washington Williams that we came to understand that there were some very early um, efforts at trying to get the world to understand the contributions of Africans to world civilization. Um, I won't go into a lot of details about George Washington Williams to, except to say that um, his publication, the first volume of his uh, publication came out in December of 1882. The title of the two-volume study was History of the Negro Race, volumes one and two which leads you to understand that he is taking into account the Africans in Africa, the Africans through the Caribbean and the North American setting and some other aspects of where Africans might have traveled throughout the world. So it was a huge mon monumental task to take on in the 1880s. Let me also re remind you that when he takes on this task, that African Americans universally had been free for approximately 20 years. So it's very monumental. The first reaction, John Hope Franklin tells us, to history of the Negro race was one of amazement that a member of that race had produced a work so extensive and at the same time written with authority and facility. Reviews began to appear in December 1882 shortly after the first volume was published and continued with the publication of the second volume in, in the spring of 1883. Um, so it's very important work to uh, take on this, uh, uh, inevitably alone at this particular time. In the 20th century, we have the phenomenon of scholars working in concert to do some of this monumental work. But George Washington Williams did it basically alone um, he lived in the United States, but he also spent a great deal of time in Africa, and his death was in London. So he uh, uh, traveled a, a great deal, and John Hope Franklin then had the difficulty of putting his life together, having to go back to uh, all of those different places. And this is one of the reasons why John Hope Franklin said that it took him so long to do the biography on George Washington Williams. It was finished in 19, uh, 1985, that is John Hope Franklin's work. And then shortly after that, there was another monumental uh, amount of work that was done, again, by essentially one individual. And this was uh, Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson was born in 1875 and would live uh, to 1950. Carter G. Woodson, in addition to major publications, also identified other ways that people could participate in the learning of information about African Americans. And so, uh, of course, this is a very recent biography that came into being, um, let's see, what's the publication date? In 1993, um, A Life in Black History, Carter G. Woodson by Jacqueline Goggin. Uh, Jacqueline is a very good friend of mine also. Um, but the importance of Carter G. Woodson is in 1915 and 1916, roughly at about the same time that John Hope Franklin was born, was in the process of establishing a very thoroughly, organ what would be a very thoroughly organized group of individuals in the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History, ASALH. Well, when it was first formed, it was actually called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Um, I don't know how much you've uh, spent in terms of the details about the people, but we have been referred in different periods by different names. And uh, the early part of the 20th century, 
uh, African Americans were called uh, Negroes. Um, so his organization, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, uh, formed chapters, that is, individual chapters in cities around the country, on college campuses around the country, so that um, even people who were not trained in higher education could also participate in the, if you will, marketing of information about African Americans and people of African descent. Uh, Carter G. Woodson had a great number of individuals who later joined him individually in his effort. Uh, individuals such as uh, Charles Wesley, Lorenzo Green, um, I can't remember all of them. Um, a woman who got her PhD uh, in the 1940s, Dr. Helen Edmonds, who worked at North Carolina Central. A lot of the individuals of his generation. The other thing that Carter G. Uh, Woodson did was to raise money so that others could um, be involved in the research without having to uh, consider how the work would be accomplished in terms of providing salary and research um, material for individuals to get a lot of the work published. And then um, in about another 10 years or so, Carter G. Woodson um, also provided us with a model of what we presently uh, celebrate and commemorate as uh, African American History Month, Black History Month. That is, in 1926, Carter G. Woodson started what, what he thought was um, something that would grow, but it was small at first, one day of celebrating African American history. This was a day in February of 1926. And he said that he wanted to choose February because this uh, particular month would commemorate the birthdays of two individuals who had been very important for African uh, people in America. These would be the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Abraham Lincoln was the country's 16th president, and his birthday is celebrated on February 12, and Frederick Douglass uh, celebrated his birthday on February the 14th. Um, Abraham Lincoln was born in um, uh, 1809 and Douglass in 1817. And Abraham Lincoln, because Abraham Lincoln was the president, who signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which universally freed um, people of African descent who were uh, slaves in, um, in the 1860s. And Frederick Douglass, because uh, Frederick Douglass had been such a vocal abolitionist, that is, a person who had dedicated, dedicated his life once he escaped, or as some would say, stole himself, uh, to trying to provide for universal emancipation of African Americans. And so it began in uh, February of 1926. Well, this one day extended eventually into a week. And for the next 50 years, that's what it was, a week in the month of February. Now, there are a whole lot of things that I don't get to share with you, for instance, um, in the early times, of course, we had historically black institutions and we had segregated schools. And particularly in the segregated schools, the teachers spent a great amount of time being very excited about and sharing with their students as much information as possibly could be shared, of course, all year. But a lot of it was especially emphasized and focused upon in the month of February and also within that week's time. So you can imagine that in the segregated schools, we spent a great deal of time celebrating people like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, a long, long list of individuals who had contributed in one way or another to developments within American society, but also connected with the African American community. So Carter G. Woodson was extremely important uh, for that effort. And um, in 1976 is when the week was extended to a month, and we now commemorate in the month of February um, African American History Month. I always 
like to really emphasize that because sometimes in some of the smaller circles I hear comments to the effect that African Americans are usually shortchanged and we are so shortchanged that we commemorate a lot of the things connected with us in the shortest month of the year and it was not established that way at all. It just turned out that the initiation for it uh, was framed with these birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. So it's really important, I think, to, to point that out. And essentially then what I'm saying is oh, another one of the books connected with Carter G. Woodson is one that just came out last year, Selling Black History for Carter G. Woodson, A Diary, 1930 to 1933, which is a diary of Lorenzo J. Green, who was one of the associates who worked with Carter G. Woodson uh, in those early years trying to establish uh, the significance of uh, the participation of African Americans in the United States, but also uh, some contributions of people of African descent throughout the world. Uh, it's really important to have a diary of such a person like Lorenzo Green because what we learn are some of the activities that occurred on a day-to-day -day basis, what were some of the discussions, what were some of the things most significant to him. And uh, there is an um, introduction in this diary that is presented by Avril E. Strickland, who was a very personal friend of Lorenzo Green just before he died a couple of years ago. So this is uh, quite significant work. Uh, and all the more significant because one of the things that occurred in uh, the history of uh, the African past has been the reliance on oral tradition. And we are now coming to understand the, the very significant importance of written documents. And so uh, to have a diary of Lorenzo Green just in partiality is extremely important. Um, all of this was to say that by the time we get to the 1960s and students are asking for information about people of African descent to be added in the, into the curriculum, there is a basis to begin with. In other words, the foundation has already been laid and then of course there were professors who were doing this already on other campuses. They may not have been at Yale or Harvard or the University of California, but they were thinking about it, they were teaching it, and there were quite a number of elementary and high school students doing it on a regular basis throughout the country. So it's not then unusual for students to make this kind of request in the late 1960s. Of course now in some instances they had to be very dramatic in their request and so in some instances students had sit-ins. Um, it was quite um, the opposite at Yale. The students, uh, along with uh, sympathetic faculty, held a conference to have discussions on the importance of the African past to world civilization and to uh, American development. And so intellectually, they sorted out what those advantages could be. And of course, one of the major advantages that they uh, came to understand is that once people could know more about each other's past, that hopefully this would help them to appreciate where they were currently, that this would um, make, would uh, 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 facilitate people getting along better. And so in the instance of, of Yale, it was a very uh, easy process. And, but in some instances, there were actually uh, sit-ins uh, to dramatically uh, get uh, college leaders administrators to understand the uh, requests coming from the students. So the field of African American studies uh, came into being in the 1960s through activism, but its foundation is that of intellectual development, uh, a development and a past that already existed and now from the 1960s others would build on. In the time after the 1960s we have uh, quite a lot to show for ourselves. I did not prepare a bibliography for you in terms of the tremendous number of uh, 
publications that are affiliated with the field of African American studies. But I will just share with you one of the most recent publications uh, simply in the area of literature uh, that the field has presented. And this is an anthology, the Norton Anthology on African American Literature. The general editors are Henry Louis Gates, Jr. and Nellie Y. McKay. Now, uh, and this book just came out in the early part of 1997. Um, it's an example of how far the field has come. In other words, um, African American studies has grown tremendously in the 25 plus years since the 1960s. And we even have very significant models at various institutions that are guiding posts for other institutions to follow. Um, and I'm very proud to say that here at the University of Houston, our program is also 25 plus years, and we have a great number of uh, very outstanding scholars who are affiliated with African American studies. Dr. Mintz with his work on the 19th century, uh, Professor Tyrone Tillery who does work on the 20th century, um, they are two historians. And we have uh, a, a historian who also uh, gets a great deal of publicity for a book that came out, what year did Dr. Jones's book come out? 1982. 1982, uh, which in its second revised edition is still winning book awards. This is the book on the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, so individuals of that uh, caliber with the English department, uh, Professors Lawrence Hogue, Professors, uh, excuse me, Professors Lawrence Hogue and Elizabeth Brown Guillory, um, myself, uh, I can't name them all, but it, the, the field is, is, uh, is growing, and although we are only about 2%, we have a lot to show for our 2%. Um, the other significant thing about an, an anthology of the nature of the um, Norton Anthology is that what the scholars have come to understand is that we are now a society which is visual. We like to see things. We also like to hear things. Things And so if you purchase the paper-bound copy of the anthology on African-American literature, you also get a sampling of some of the songs related to African-American literature and African-American culture from the uh, Negro spirituals of the 19th century all the way down through the 20th century and hip-hop music. It's extremely important, and I've talked to about four or five professors on campus already who plan to use this. In, um, in the fall in some of our courses. Um, and, and so this is where we are currently. We are in the process of doing work. The field also has an aspect that is also activist. Not that we are demanding things, but that we are very interested in the scholarly pursuit applying to public policy issues. For instance, within African American Studies at the University of Houston, we also have an Institute for the Study of African American Life. So this is a component of the field that deals in the kinds of questions that Professor Mintz presented. You know, how do we know that there is a price that is related to life expectancy, to cost of living, to all of those different kinds of things? And so we have sociologists and economists who work on issues like that. The, the, uh, model or the most significant model that many of us point to in terms of where we would like to see all of the programs reach is the model at Harvard University which is run by Professor Henry Louis Gates and he has brought to Harvard uh, seven very significant scholars. I can't name them all but I do know a few of them without having to think really hard about who they are. Cornell West, who is in philosophy and religion, uh, Elizabeth Higginbotham, who is in religion, um, and also William Julius Wilson, who is uh, in sociology. Um, Professor Gates became the director of that program in 1991, and he has done extremely well with it since that time. He has raised uh, over $11 million specifically for that program. They've moved into new facilities and 
Uh, we'd like to see all of our programs do just as well. And, and so what I, what I love to say about the Harvard model is that they are also doing some things that will free other programs to do, to dedicate themselves to other adventures. For instance, I, I brought along an article about the Harvard, it's called uh, Harvard's Powerhouse. The, the long title of the article is, Can Harvard's Powerhouse Alter the Course of Black Studies? And one of the things that I failed to say in talking about the past of African American studies is that in the formation of the programs in the 1960s, they were referred to as black studies programs. Uh, but that was also one of the words that was applied to African Americans of that time. We went through a whole phase in the 1960s called uh, the Black Power Movement, which uh, 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 allowed for people to refer to uh, African Americans as black. And this is a term that is still used, but it's used interchangeably now with African American. But anyway, uh, some of the work that is under being um, uh, it, that is ongoing at Harvard is that the group of individuals gathered there in their African American Studies program are taking on these huge monu monumental tasks similar to the one-man shows of the 1900s and earlier times. For instance, they are working on an encyclopedia Africana that will deal with the entire African experience. Not only are they working on that, but when they get it finished, it will be available on CD-ROM, which is the modern technology to make this very accessible to the public. So one of the things that we want to see happen with African American studies is as we continue to do the research, find out particular kinds of information, we want this to be accessible to people who are interested in knowing about it and the technology dictates now that it must be available through computer technology and the CD-ROM is uh, going to make that possible. Uh, one of the things that uh, Henry Lewis, oh, one of the other projects that they have uh, ongoing is the Black Periodical Literature Project which uh, started at Yale in the 1980s but will eventually be finished off uh, connected with the Harvard program and this is um, a way of uh, finding, uh, making available a lot of the publications from the past. For, for instance, we found a novel that is dated uh, a little earlier than Brown's uh, uh, novel that came out. I think Brown's came out in the 1850s. Um, but. Um, and it, it, since I didn't write it down, of course it won't come to me, but there's a, um, the one by, um, I can't, uh, can't think, the, think of the name right now. Um, but that periodical uh, search is going to turn up short stories and uh, things related to literature that is not, that is not made available so readily. Um, and the ambition of Gates and others who are very ambitious along with him is that what Gates says is that we want to make available to future generations things that are taking so long for us to answer. Very basic kinds of things. For instance, we still don't know in a more summary fashion what were the total number of Africans that, who were brought out of Africa in the entire process of the enslavement. Um, bits and pieces of information that we can provide for others to have freer intellectual analysis in dealing with once we are gone on. And of course the legacy, the hope is that once the next generation is here that they will be interested in the same kinds of things that we were interested in and that they will have another kind of foundation. So they'll have the material that was available to us from the previous generations, they'll have the material that we are able to gather and then they will uh, be able to add to maybe if we haven't sorted out as many of the questions that they would like to see addressed. And of course one of the future things that we certainly want to see um, African American studies do is to 
be able for communication to exist between the community, that is, between the uh, intellectual community, which we refer to all the time as the university setting, that there is an ongoing dialogue between universities with the individuals involved in this work and media or whoever the interested parties might be. So for instance, if there is something of significance that we should know about Houston, if, if someone is coming into Houston with these kinds of questions, they will be able to come to African American Studies at the University of Houston and get those answers uh, very quickly or have discussions um, very quickly about them. So we hope that there would be the ongoing uh, continuation of interest in the subject. And we also hope that in future years that maybe what will happen is that we won't see uh, necessarily an African American Studies program that uh, we will have those subjects addressed within the regular, that is within the general curriculum of schools like the University of Houston. So if we are successful then what we would have accomplished is to be um, so successful that we can put ourselves out of business, which means that the subject would have become significant enough to the American public that it's not something that we as African Americans would have to ask of others, but that others would feel that it is significant that they take it on themselves. And of course we have a lot of that already uh, ongoing. I want to ask if you have any questions, specific questions now that I can address in the last few minutes that I have. I do have a question. Yes. You just mentioned um, wanting to make African American studies departments uh, a place for um, questions and a place for other universities to engage in dialogue. Um, to what extent have departments become a clearinghouse for, say, uh, the non-university related people of uh, of this country to go to, say, um, I'm thinking of teachers, for example, mm -hmm. the idea of a clearinghouse uh, for information? Well, we, we see ourselves as a major resource um, because of the great number of individuals specifically involved in research, whether that is science or whether it's humanities or whether it's social sciences. And um, for instance, with uh, some of the uh, political developments in Africa of current times, uh, f or to be, to be really specific, there is a debate tomorrow afternoon in the Department of Anthropology on the question of conservation and what impact that has on Africans. And so we have uh, professors here on this campus who readily know the information, who are involved in the research, and this is why they so readily know it and individuals from the community can come and have a dialogue without having to go and spend hours and hours looking for some of the information themselves. I'm not saying that that's not a good process, but if they want to cut through some of the um, work involved, then the scholars are available and can even point them to some of the resources more quickly. So this is something that's ongoing with the university, and I, what I'm saying is that I'd like to see African American studies uh, really involved in that in a bigger way. Thank you. What I'd like to do in the last few minutes that we have, uh, actually we have quite a few minutes, we have two parts to the end of the, of the show. I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of new social movements to situate the idea of multiculturalism within a historical framework and uh, link up a little bit with an idea that was presented very earlier in the semester. And I'm Should I start over? <laughs> what I'm going to be doing is talk a little bit about uh, new versus old social movements uh, as a way to contextualize discussions of multiculturalism at the end of the that arises here at the end of the 20th century. And let's talk about a couple of styles of, or visions of what multiculturalism is. 
and to return to a theme that was presented at the beginning of the semester regarding the relationship between social science and humanities forms of knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge through humanities and social science disciplines, and that, that knowledge's relationship to everyday life and specifically social change politics. Uh, and then I'll talk for about, give me 10 minutes, and I'll cede the floor to Steve to end the show. I guess what I want to do is ask the question, how is so social change possible? How is social change possible? And in the old days, the answer to this question was, uh, there was a couple of answers. Uh, from a leftist, politically leftist position, that is to say Marxist position, the answer was, of course, social change is possible through class mobilization, through the mo mobilization of communities identified and cons cons consolidated as a community via their relationship to economic production. That relationship to economic production is what cons constitutes that community as a class. Another, this was one of the most important ways of organizing uh, direct or consciously creating a movement so as to create social change. Social change here, of course, is understood as a relationship to the state. Why do you want to create social change? Well, to have better, you, to realize your vision of utopia. But in order to do so, what do you have to do? You mobilize as a community, here is defined as a class, in order to take hold of the state, the nation state, the political apparatus, the governmental apparatus that legislates over the social field. This, thus, this is how you create social change. This is one way of, of what we can call the old social movements. Some of the other old social movements were sex-based and race-based. Right? Uh, that is to say, social movements around which were the mobilization of communities were based on identification in terms of sex or race. And thus we have a whole history of uh, which uh, Linda Reed has uh, indicated some of that history in terms of uh, the African-American experience. And we've had other lecturers talk about other aspects of those old, old social movements. Uh, these old social movements, perhaps now are not so old because we see them in the 60s, the civil rights movements. Perhaps that's a m place where we see them sort of consolidated, the old social movements. So um, what is new? What is a new social movement? New social movements arise in the end of the 80s in the global context of several transformations. The end of the Cold War principally is one of the, one of the factors, global factors, that initiate or, or situate the emergence of new social movements. Um, the end of colonialism throughout the globe, post-colonial moment, uh, and specifically, the, I want to focus on the end of uh, the Cold War. And for the Americas, this has meant that the militarization of, of the Americas that occurred in the 60s, 70s, and that exploded in the 80s in various kinds of civil wars, such as in Central America, the end of the Cold War uh, caused a significant kind of shift in the way politics were occurring in the Central, in the Americas, U.S. foreign policy with regard to Latin American countries. It was no longer possible to create policies of social, of foreign policy on this part of the United States of intruding into other countries in the Americas on the basis of preventing a communist infiltration, a communist threat, communist uh, taking over of governments. So in this context, you have the continuate, you have the end of communist threats, but what you have is the end of communist threats, but the maintenance of various kinds of dictatorships, totalitarian regimes, authoritarian regimes that are thoroughly non democratic, that had been put into place through U.S. aid, through U.S. foreign policy in aiding these governments to maintain sort of ki various kinds of authoritarian regimes that are undemocratic. So in this context, Peoples of the Americas, of Latin America, have sought to pol have sought political mobilizations and sought to, to mobilize their energies in order to change the social conditions. In other words, 
to attain greater democratic forms of life throughout the, throughout the society. The shift here, one shift, is that instead of, because with the end of the, end of the Cold War, what we have is the end of the threat of communists or socialists causing a revolution, which, what is the aim of a revolution? The aim of a revolution is to take over the government, to take over the state apparatus. So the new aim here is no longer to take over the state, but to mobilize within the framework of the society in order to ask of the state for it to change, in legal terms, various aspects of the organization of society, to open up freedoms, to democratize the society in various kinds of ways. What's so new about this? We saw this in the 60s, civil rights movements. So perhaps this is new in a certain sense. The civil rights movement certainly was not an attempt to overthrow the government, although the FBI, the CIA, and the government did think of that, and that's why we had such events as, which uh, Linda Reed so uh, uh, diplomatically phrased as aggressive uh, 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 mobilizations, right? Activism. What's that? Dramatic activism. Dramatic activism. <laughs> that's right. Very, <laughs> very, very well stated. Dramatic activism. That dramatic activism was not oriented towards taking over the state. Right? But it was still, we had different civil rights movements, and there were links between the African American movement, the Hispanic brown power Chicano movements, the, the, gender, the women's rights movements. Right? But they were pretty much separate entities. Right? And so what we see at the end of the 80s across the Americas is attempts no longer to take over the state, and that shift in orientation has caused a the, the, it has compelled people to seek greater horizontal alliances across these different kinds of categories of possible community. Sex-based communities, gender-based communities, racial-based, ethnic-based communities, cultural communities, and so on. Class-based communities. So that now, whereas, we, whereas before, the civil rights movement was, there was no working class movement in the civil rights. But now, in the end of the 80s, we see new social movements in which there are linkages between class unions, unions which are mobilizations of class communities, class-based communities, with mobilizations of women, with mobilizations of indigenous peoples, with different kinds of racial-based communities and mobilizations. So this is what we're seeing at the end of the 80s in the, in the breakdown of of the Cold War regime, the threat of communism, the end of communism, the end of uh, that kind of whole attempt to take over the, the state apparatus. And instead we see an attempt to rework the state apparatus. Because I think there's an also a realization that to take over the state means that you are now in control of the state and you have to figure out how to control people, which means that you're eventually going to be the target of somebody else's social movement, right? Social revolution. So now the shift is to rework the state and open it up in different kinds of ways. Multiculturalism is one such movement, is one kind, is an example of this kind of new social movement. How is it, it clearly, as uh, the history that we just heard about the African Americans case, it clearly derives from a long history of ethnic, of racial based movements. Specifically we can uh, link, we can see it the, the multiculturalism linked directly to civil rights movements, the 60s, whereas different kinds of groups sought to enter into the educational system, into the university, and create studies programs, women's studies programs, African-American studies programs, Chicano studies programs, and of course, more recently, we have gay lesbian studies programs or gender programs. So multiculturalism is very important as an example of new social movements. And it exemplifies something for us, something that I, I sought to raise in particular at the beginning of the, of the semester when we talked about how can we understand the history of the conquest, the European conquest of the Americas. And I gave as an example, a specific example, the Spanish conquest of Mexico, of, of the Anahuac, of the Mexica peoples in Mexico. And I said that the kinds of ways in which we give historical explanations of this conquest, must be linked to the present day. 
The reasons why we give a certain explanation of that conquest is very much linked to the organization of power, identities, and cultures in the present moment. And so I think, what is multiculturalism? Multiculturalism is an attempt in the university to create a certain kind of knowledge about the past and about the present, which has very specific immediate aims to transform the present. And so they attempt, for example, to, to provide alternative histories of the conquest of Mexico, alternative histories of the history of colonialism within the Americas, alternative histories of sex and gender relationship in the Americas in the hemispheric perspective, different interpretations of everything that we've been discussing in this class, is very important because it ultimately has a very pragmatic and practical orientation. We're very much concerned with addressing the question, how is social change possible? And the classroom then is one scene, or one battleground, if you will, one theater of war, one theater of operations, by which new actors within different and new social movements are seeking to effectively change the social situation in which we're living in at present. I think perhaps I should stop there and hope that somehow this has been effective. Thanks. This class has been an experiment. It has asked the question, is it possible to reshape academia to reflect truly multicultural and comparative perspectives? Much of the history, sociology, anthropology, literature that we receive comes from a particular point of view, point of view we call Eurocentrism. Now, what we simply meant by that was that it privileges a certain experience and tends to marginalize other experiences. What we sought to do in this class is to change that and to give a whole variety of perspectives equal play. Scholarship in this country is going through a sea change. There is incredibly exciting work taking place in fields like Latin American studies, Mexican American studies, and African American studies. This scholarship, however, has not become familiar to the large public audience. And so the purpose of this class was to showcase that new scholarship and share its excitement. All around us, old assumptions, old perspectives are being shattered. Now, vaguely, the public is aware that this is going on. George Will writes about it every week in his columns. And I think the dominant reaction by the public is fear that somehow changes are taking place and they don't make any sense, uh, that their traditional understanding of the world is being challenged and no one has the slightest idea of what's being put in its place. What we've tried to do over the last 14 sessions is to put a new perspective into place. And so what I'd like to do next is to summarize what I see as some of the major themes and issues that we've dealt with here and see if we can pull it together and, and get a coherent sense of where we've been and where we'll be. Our class began 14 sessions ago with a critique of Eurocentrism. We challenged the idea that in 1492, Europe was decisively more advanced than either Africa or the Americas. No one would have doubted in 1492 that Asia was supreme to all. Uh, what we saw is that Europe, America, and Africa all shared 
certain cultural, economic, scientific advantages, and that there was nothing, nothing at all, that guaranteed that Europe would rise to global dominance. Europe's one big advantage in 1492 was a tradition of long distance shipping. But other than that, in areas like urban development, metallurgy, and the like, it would have been indistinguishable between the Americas, Africa, and Europe. Indeed, we went further and we looked at some of the languages that people used to describe Africa and the Americas and how this very language was Eurocentric or biased. That is, people looked at the art of the Americas or of Africa and labeled it to be primitive, uh, a word that's still often used by uh, art historians even today. But it's not primitive. It's only primitive if you don't understand it. Uh, it looks an awful lot like abstract modern art, which is, of course, based on it. Uh, and therefore, it's not so primitive after all. We saw that other concepts also reflected biases. African or American religions were often labeled by Europeans as superstitions. But in fact, we saw that they were sophisticated belief systems. Politics, too, was viewed through a Eurocentric framework. The state is very central to the development of political organization in the West. But stateless societies were extremely important in the Americas and in Africa. They were different. They were not inferior. And even family structures were quite different in the Americas and in Africa, where larger units like clans or lineages exercised important functions in socialization. So we saw that the traditional Western civ approach to the world has certain biases in it, that it tends to view the world from a Europe-dominated perspective, but that there are other perspectives we can look at. We then shifted to European conquest and to European colonization. The first point that my colleague emphasized is that conquest itself was not nearly as clear-cut as we sometimes assume, or as the word implies, because in general, Conquest involved negotiated compromises. Without any doubt, uh, Spain, France, Britain, Holland exercised the upper hand. But to say that they exercised the upper hand is not at all to say that they wrote the entire script. Instead, what we saw was a process of syncretism and hybridization as groups negotiated with each other. And this has continued to be a process that continues to today. Domination is clear, near, very rarely clear cut. Usually, domination involves some kind of accommodation, we might say. Now, we also showed that colonialism itself was responsible for Europe's rise to global dominance. It was the emergence of an Atlantic economy based on the production of sugar, of gold, trade, based ultimately on slavery and other forms of unfree labor that explained Europe's tremendous rise to world power. Now, colonialism, we saw, took very different forms in different parts of the world. Uh, Spanish colonialism involved conquest and the extraction of labor from the indigenous population. French colonialism emphasized trade and therefore cooperative relationships between 
native peoples and the French. The English form of colonization involved the establishment of white settler colonies and the removal or extermination of the indigenous population. Now the point we emphasize in our course is that these different patterns of colonialism that were set in motion hundreds of years ago would have lasting consequences for the future. This was particularly true in Latin America. What Spanish and Portuguese colonialism did in that part of the world is it placed control of land and control of labor in the hands of a relatively small number of people. It discouraged economic modernization and it created a political system that was committed to preserving inequalities. Colonialism, in short, played a critical role in underdeveloping Latin American economies. Now, the southern states in North America followed a somewhat similar pattern. It was the Northeast that underwent a very different experience. It was the very weakness of central British authority that encouraged the growth of a modern industrial economy in the northeastern states. Control of land, control of resources was not in a small number of hands. No small elite controlled resources. Governments did not impede the development of commerce or markets. Indeed, government played an active role in the development of modern capitalism. So we call it free enterprise, but it was a product not of an invisible hand, like Adam Smith would say, but rather by the very central role of government. Government subsidized transportation companies. Government established protective tariffs that aided manufacturers. Foreign capital flowed to the United States. One third of all the capital that went into industry before the uh, Civil War came from overseas. And foreign immigrants from Ireland and Germany provided the Norse economy with a massive cheap labor force. But colonialism, we saw, is not simply an economic phenomenon. Colonialism is also a cultural and even a psychological phenomenon. The colonizer's goal is not simply to extract wealth. It's not simply to extract resources. It is to impose their culture, their religion, their language, their values. Now, in Latin America, the Spanish and Portuguese were never wholly successful in imposing their own culture. Instead, what emerged was a hybrid or syncretic culture. It combined elements of European civilization and indigenous civilizations. It combined European beliefs and practices and indigenous beliefs and practices. What Octavio Paz and Lois Zamora described to us was a Baroque culture, an ornate culture that could take elements both of European culture and American culture. Uh, and this Baroque culture had very different attitudes towards history, towards the body, towards tradition, towards sexuality, towards race than the starker Protestant culture that took root in the United States. Now we went on and we showed that the shaping experiences of the United States in Latin America have been very, very different. The key defining experiences in U.S. history 
have been westward expansion, the conquest of the frontier, and economic growth. And these experiences have instilled certain fundamental values in our culture, a belief that we need to be unified in the face of hostile threats, an assumption that violence is sometimes necessary for social progress, a belief in the superiority of our culture, and a faith in the inevitability of progress. All of these, I believe, have grown out of our historical experience. And even before the Civil War, we saw the United States had developed a culture that celebrated individualism, celebrated mobility, and celebrated liberation from tradition. But Latin America's experience has been very, very different. It is not a history of progress and expansion. It is a history of colonial subjugation and economic underdevelopment. And not surprisingly, this historical experience has given rise to a very, very different culture. In contrast to the United States' highly individualistic culture, Latin American societies give much more emphasis to collective values and to collective traditions. So if we in the United States would agree with Henry Ford that history is bunk, few Latin Americans would share that same attitude because the history they've experienced is not dead, it's still alive. And so it's not surprising that the art and literature and music that has emerged in Latin America is quite different than the art, literature, and music that has arisen in the United States. Latin American culture has been greatly affected by a tradition we called magical realism. Latin American art and literature incorporate elements of myth and fantasy. Above all, they incorporate multiple perspectives simultaneously. The perspectives of Africans, of Indians, of Europeans all coexist at once because people truly have a triple consciousness, we might say. Above all, Latin American writers and artists are very conscious of their political role in their society. They are political figures, not mere esthetes, as we might say, of American writers and artists. And then we turned to the various features of modern society. One feature is global migration, the mass movement of peoples across borders. Today this is truly an international process and the United States is being reshaped as people arrive from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America. Another feature of modern society is mass communication. In a modern society, our values, our myths, our ideologies, these are the products of a distinct culture industry and the instruments of mass communication, like film, television, radio, CDs, and the like. Now words like the United States or Latin America, of course, disguise vast differences within those societies. Race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, all of these shape people's experiences and identities. But in the United States, we have tended to place people in fairly rigid compartments and have failed to, I think, truly recognize the diversity that actually characterizes our society. What we've tried to demonstrate in our class is the idea that identity is not something innate. It is not something biological. 
It is a social and cultural construct. But to say that it's a construct is not to say it is not real. It's as real as anything in the world. It is a product of shared memories, of shared historical experiences, shared traditions, shared rituals, shared myths, shared symbols. Yet identities are not unchanging. They are always evolving. Identities are dynamic. And we can see this in our own lifespan. Identities based on gender and on sexuality have become much more important in the last quarter century than they had ever been at any other time in history. So let me offer my last thoughts about the concepts of identity, culture, and power that we've talked about in our course. For more than a century, the dominant function of American education was to take in millions of immigrants and Americanize them. That is, to suppress their original cultures and instill a common culture. Now, the pressures for homogenization were not just in our milk, uh, not just in our schools. They were a product of our business culture and a product of mass communications as well. In comparison to the forces for conformity in our society, the forces for diversity were quite weak because our society was fragmented into so many distinct religions and ethnic groups. There were no rival ideologies or institutions that challenged the dominant values. Now, what were those dominant values? Values like individualism, mobility, fulfillment through consumerism, uh, and an emphasis on personal freedom. But despite all this, collective identities rooted in ethnicity, religion, and historical experience persist. Now, for some people, those identities are easily shed. But for many women, and especially for racial minorities, these identities are much more all-encompassing. Second, culture. In the United States, all cultures are the product of two forces. One force is interactions among peoples. Diverse ethnic, religious, racial, regional groups come into contact and create new cultures. The second force shaping culture in the United States is commercialization, the market imperative to make money. All culture in the United States is a commodity that can be bought and sold. And this tends to trivialize and depoliticize all forms of cultural expression, especially compared to Latin America. In the United States, there are very few intact, pristine cultures. Indeed, the most authentic cultures in the United States are the cultures of the poor. They're found in inner cities. They're found in ghettos. They're found in barrios. They're found in poor rural areas. These are the most productive and inventive areas of cultural ferment in our society, whether it's rap, whether it's Tejano music, whether it's hip hop. They don't seem to come from the suburbs. But our cultures constantly try to find these authentic expressions and commercialize them. And finally, we have the issue of power. The Americas are very much a product of European capitalist expansion. Leif Erikson arrived in the New World in the year 1000, and it made no difference. But the reason Columbus's voyage mattered is because the New World offered raw materials and valuable land on which to raise commercial crops. The history of the Americas cannot be divorced from the process of capitalist expansion. And that process has gone through 
series of cycles, which is what I want to end with today. The first cycle was mercantilist capitalism. That is, Europe established colonies in the New World. But those colonies were shattered in the late 18th century by wars of independence. Not just the American Revolution, but the Haitian Revolution when slaves overthrew their European masters, and then the revolutions in Latin America. The second phase of expansion involved the incorporation of frontier regions. Indigenous peoples were destroyed or subordinated, but they continued to resist for decades. The third phase was investment in extractive industries by U.S. citizens in Latin America. And this would lead to nationalization and expropriation of these industries. We're now in the last phase, the highest phase, of true globalization. American and foreign industry are moving to all corners of the world and we're becoming truly one global economy. But if history is any guide, I think we're not going to see the McDonaldization or the coca colization of the world. Every period of European expansion in the past has been marked by an acute reaction and resistance. And if I were to draw on history, and to gaze into my crystal ball, I would anticipate that what we'll see in the 21st century is another wave of that resistance and reaction. Thank you very much.